You're listening to Conferences Online Allergy from Children's Mercy Hospitals and Clinics in Kansas City, Missouri. Today is July 9, 2012, and I'm your host, Dr. Jay Portnoy. Our topic today, anaphylaxis. Our presenter is Dr. Phil Lieberman. He's a clinical professor of medicine and pediatrics at the University of Tennessee College of Medicine in Memphis, Tennessee. Then. Okay. Um, so our next uh, presenter is Dr. Phil Lieberman. Uh, Dr. Lieberman is a clinical professor of medicine and pediatrics in the Department of Internal Medicine and Pediatrics at the University of Tennessee College of Medicine in Memphis, Tennessee. Do- Dr. Lieberman also is a former president of the American Academy of Allergy. Uh, he's an editor of the uh, Practice Parameter on Anaphylaxis and is a, uh, recognized as a world expert in the topic of anaphylaxis. Uh, so we're really grateful to have him here today to talk with us about this very important topic. I'm going to go ahead and make you a presenter, Dr. Lieberman. Okay. So you should see a little thing that says show my screen. Can we click it? Yep, click it. Got it. Can we see your screen? So take it away, Dr. Lieberman. Welcome to Conferences on Online Allergy. Okay. Um, let me ask you. I've got something called screen sharing in the corner. Oh, I see how to close it. Okay, good. Do you see do you see it? We uh, see, see it. Fine. Great. Okay. We're gonna start. Uh, I had a little bit too long a lecture. I had to cut it down a bit this morning. So I'm gonna start with uh, the uh, Samson definition of uh, of anaphylaxis, which is a uh, two system uh, definition as you can see. Rule of twos, uh, skin, mucosal tissue or both with either respiratory compromise or reduced blood pressure to uh, uh, occurring without a known exposure to an antigen or after exposure to a likely antigen uh, involvement of the skin, respiratory tract, reduced blood pressure, or persistent GI symptoms, and a single system, which is uh, shock, uh, with uh, exposure to a known antigen. And the reason I show that, I, you're all familiar with that, it's been present since 2006, but I want to show you a recent article which validated this. Uh, it appeared in Jackie in March of 2012. And what they did was uh, take the Samson criteria uh, in an emergency room uh, and try and validate it. And what they found was uh, the sensitivity was quite high. It's uh, 96.7%. The specificity was 82.4 percent. So they, uh, the positive predictive value, 68.6 percent, negative predictive value of 98.4 percent. So uh, basically, what they found is that it's uh, very sensitive, uh, not quite so specific, but still, it's a pretty validated uh, uh, definition, and and we can use it uh, for research purposes. This is another uh, fairly new thing that uh, you're going to be seeing more of quite, quite, quite soon. Uh, and this is anaphylaxis in America. It was modeled after asthma in America, uh, allergy in America, uh, and the uh, poll is now completed. Uh, there are, I think, about six of us involved in it, led by Robert Wood. And we just completed uh, the first section, which was presented by Abstract at the Academy. The next session will be at the college. Uh, And this was the patient poll. It's quite interesting. If you just ask people, uh, uh, have you experienced anaphylaxis, 7.7% of the population uh, said that they had experienced an episode. If you then sort of wean these down, uh, you, you, they required multi-system involvement, they had to have gone to a hospital, and they have to have felt that their life was in danger. And 2.5% of the population surveyed said they had anaphylaxis and met these requirements. So really, uh, it's probably more frequent than we had previously suspected. And if you look at the best data prior to this survey, It's Estelle Simon's data uh, that uh, what she did was measure real-time prescriptions in Manitoba, Canada. Mm -hmm. And if you look at that, these are prescriptions for an automatic epinephrine injector. 
and 1.4 percent of uh, population 0 to 16 received a prescription and all ages it was around 1 percent in the blue bar on the uh, on the uh, right now so I think we can conclude pretty well uh, from the combination of these two studies that a minimum of one to a maximum of perhaps 2.5 percent uh, of the population uh, uh, has experienced an episode and is therefore at risk. And what we also know, and, and there's just no doubt about this, I just picked up one study, but there are now about seven, uh, that in every uh, industrialized country in the world, uh, the incidence of anaphylaxis, as is the incidence of atopy, uh, is increasing. And uh, it is increasing more rapidly than any other, in quotes, uh, allergic disease. By that I mean uh, asthma or, or even allergic rhinitis. This is Mayo Clinic data. And they performed a survey in the 1980s, 1990s, uh, and then repeated it a few years ago. And you can see the red line uh, uh, using the same identical techniques uh, show the increase in incidence per 100,000 population uh, in uh, Rochester, Minnesota. And this has been done in New York and several other uh, states as well as several other countries. We're going to talk now about the factors that increase the incidence and severity. And one of the things uh, is atopy. These are anaphylactic episodes graded by severity. Excuse me, anaphylactoid, that is non-IgE-mediated uh, reactions graded by severity. And if you compare that in the same series, there's over 700 people in this series. If you look at anaphylactic episodes graded by severity, uh, they are more severe. Uh, and of course, atopy is a risk factor for anaphylaxis. There's no question about that. And it's quite interesting that it's a risk factor not only for anaphylactic IgE-mediated events, but for non-IgE-mediated events, uh, for example, those produced by radio contrast. And the reason for that is that um, the cytokine milieu uh, that bathes the cells in atopic individuals, as you know, is uh, IL-4, IL-5, IL-13. Uh, and that uh, it decreases the threshold for histamine release, both in mast cells and basophils. And that's been demonstrated both uh, in humans uh, and animal models. So atopy is a risk factor not only for, for incidence, but also for severity. Another very interesting thing is that uh, asthma uh, is a risk factor. And uh, this, there are two studies now, one done in the US, one done in uh, England. This is the English study uh, in Jackie. The uh, US study was in annals. And patients with asthma have a greater risk of anaphylaxis than those without asthma. And it's quite interesting. The risk is greater the more severe the asthma. Women are at higher risk than men, uh, especially those women with severe asthma. And another interesting factor that came from both of these studies is that this is true not only for atopic asthmatics, but for non-atopic or intrinsic asthmatics. So it's not just uh, the fact that asthmatics have an increased incidence of atopy. It is the fact that they are asthmatic per se. We've known for a long time uh, that in the adult population, uh, females are at increased risk. In infants under one, it's clearly males in a limited number of studies that have been done. And up to about age nine or so, uh, um, in, in many studies, although not in ours, which I'm showing you here, uh, males predominate. Uh, but once you hit puberty, there's no question that all studies are in agreement, uh, females predominate. And, and certainly that's hormonal because uh, uh, at, at, at the time of the menopause, uh, as you can see on the far right-hand side, uh, side of the slide, the uh, incidence begins to become uh, equivalent. Uh, and this has been shown uh, on a number of occasions. So uh, a hormonal factors, a progesterone especially, uh, plays a role. And progesterone, uh, just like uh, atopy, uh, decreases the threshold dose necessary for degranulation of both basophils and mast cells. Another is the north-south gradient in the US. And 
this it looks at automatic epinephrine uh, prescriptions. And as you can see, uh, they're uh, more frequent in the north. And this was controlled for uh, access to care, number of allergists practicing uh, uh, in, in each region, uh, and all the other epidemiologic factors uh, that uh, were looked at. And if you look at the state of California as a microcosm of this, the same holds true. That is, more epinephrine prescriptions uh, in the north of California than in the south. And this, of course, correlates with sunlight. And so it's uh, proposed uh, that vitamin D levels are playing a role. And if you look at Australia, uh, it's just the opposite. That is, uh, towards the north of Australia, this looks at latitude in Australia, and we're looking at EpiPen uh, prescription rates. And basically, it's the reverse of the United States. Uh, that is, in the south, where there's a little sunlight, uh, you get a lot of uh, epi prescriptions. And as you progress to the north towards the equator, where there's a lot, uh, you get fewer. So it's felt that this may be due to vitamin D, but that has not been confirmed by vitamin D levels. We're going to go to another topic now, and that's we're going to look at the pathophysiology of events, because uh, the one thing that we know for sure is that this is not solely a mast cell basophil-mediated disorder. That is uh, solely a histamine, leukotriene, a prostaglandin, et cetera, mediated disorder. There are a number of cytokines released during anaphylaxis. This study is by Simon Brown and colleagues. And what he did was measure these things in anaphylactic episodes <clears throat> as they occurred entering the emergency room. He's an emergency room physician uh, in Australia. And uh, as you can see, IL-2, IL-6, IL-10, TNF-alpha receptor 1, mesotryptase, and histamine, all that they measured uh, were uh, elevated. Uh, and that levels of IL-6, TNF-alpha receptor 1, which is a surrogate for TNF-alpha, mast cell histamine, and mast cell tryptase, all correlated uh, with shock, with uh, hypotension. Uh, gene, uh, calcium gene-related protein is seen in this slide. And that, uh, along with substance P and other neurokinins, uh, are elevated. Uh, you, you see histamine in the middle one, CGRP in the bottom one. Uh, and that's now been shown for other um, uh, neurokinins as well. So what happens during anaphylaxis is that histamine titillates uh, the peripheral nerve endings. And when you do that, you get what's called antidromic stimulation. That is, uh, the uh, nerve conduction goes part of the way uh, to the brain, turns around, means against the normal flow, and goes back and hits mast cells uh, and uh, hits nerve endings. And then these uh, will release. It magnifies the reaction. Uh, and you release these uh, neurokinins, neurokinin A, substance P, and CGRP. And then you also activate multiple pathways. If we look at a mast cell, we release heparin tryptase, activates the contact system, activates factor 12, activates plasmin, which activates complement and clotting. And so during uh, episodes, uh, you can find decreased complement, activation of the contact system with kinins, and activation of the coagulation pathway. And in fact, in the largest series of deaths by Pumphrey, over 200 deaths, uh, seven died with uh, disseminated uh, intravascular uh, coagulation. And uh, epsilon amyocorporic acid, or in Europe, tranexamic acid, has been used now in several cases uh, to reverse uh, the uh, episode and uh, uh, prevent fatalities. Uh, it's interesting that heparin, which we normally think of as anti-phlogistic, uh, can activate factor 12, uh, causing bradykinin formation. If you look uh, at the uh, left-hand column, we see heparin here and bradykinin formation when incubated with Hagen factor. Uh, if you look at heparinase, when that's been added uh, to the right-hand column, uh, it's, um, the effect is, ab is obliterated. Now, uh, that brings us to a study in the New England Journal a few years ago that you're probably familiar with, but I'd like to go over again. There was an epidemic of heparin-related anaphylactic events uh, a, a couple of years ago. 
and it was traced to the contamination of heparin <coughs> up here with oversulfated chondroitin sulfate. Uh, all of the lots were produced in China, and chondroitin sulfate, sulfate, as you know, is a, is a part of the contents of mast cells from which we derive heparin. And they were uh, impurities in this, uh, so that they were oversulfated at the two positions shown by the amber rings. When this was given to patients, uh, what happened was that you activated the uh, bradykinin system. You activated calocrine. Here we see uh, oversulfated chondroitin sulfate. Uh, this is the synthetic oversulfated chondroitin sulfate. And this was the contaminated taken from mast cells, contaminated uh, rather taken from the heparin. And not only did it that, but it also activated uh, complement. This is oversulfate chondroitin sulfate generate of, generation of complement mediated C5A anaphylatoxin. So it, it, it actually produced complement split products from human plasma. Uh, and the interesting thing about these cases is that they were clearly anaphylactic in nature in that they were hypotensive, uh, but they had a, two peculiar findings. Uh, they had a marked increase of angioedema compared to uh, uh, IgE-mediated events, and they had a marked increase in abdominal pain. And when one thinks about the fact that the calocrine system was activated with kinin, uh, these things are, of course, reminiscent of hereditary angioedema. Yeah. So that the, the take-home message from those previous slides is that we have to think of this as a, a potentially activating multiple phlogistic pathways, uh, complement uh, kinin systems, uh, neurokinins, uh, and clotting. There are two events uh, recently described that I want to discuss next. One is galactose alpha-1,3 galactose, and the other is mast cell activating syndromes. And the reason that I want to bring those up is that in the last two to three years, uh, they have been uh, probably the most important discoveries in this particular area. And we're going to start with galactose alpha-1,3 galactose. This is a picture of it, and this is found in the FAD segment of cetuximab. Unlike other monoclonal antibodies, cetuximab is produced in the mouse cell line sp2 backslash 0. This particular mouse and no other mouse expresses the gene for alpha-1,3 galactosyl transferase, which is the enzyme that causes the production of galactose alpha-1,3 galactose or alpha-gal. Now, alpha-gal is found in all non-primate mammals. Humans, you and I, have natural IgG and IgM against uh, uh, alpha-gal. And it is the major uh, 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 antigen uh, preventing transplants, uh, both from a hematologic, uh, rather from a hematologic uh, standpoint. Uh, you make uh, uh, IG, you, you, your IgM antibodies react, uh, and you fix complement. Mm. So uh, alpha gal, if you look at the cetuximab uh, monoclonal antibody, I've inserted the structure of alpha gal sort of where it sits uh, on the FAB portion. This is a uh, uh, human, humanized. Uh, it's an umab, so that the majority of this antibody is going to be human, the FC portion. But the light chain and heavy and, and the antibody combining sites uh, are from the mouse. So it'll sit up here. And then uh, if you have an antibody against it, you will, of course, react to it. And it so happened that when they, it, it's the highest instance of anaphylaxis of any monoclonal antibody. And when they looked at where all of this occurred, it occurred in, in patients who lived where I live. It occurred in the South. It didn't occur in California, and it didn't occur in Boston. Uh, and um, these areas, I'm going to go back to that slide for a second. These areas are areas of uh, uh, epidemiologically of the uh, Lone Star Tick. So the people who discovered this, uh, Scott McCommons and Thomas Pletz Mills, 
uh, it probably I would I would give it my reward for one of the best uh, the best article of the year in allergy uh, in when it appeared in the New England Journal for that year. Uh, theorized that the reason that uh, people got it in the South was that this uh, antigen might be present in parasites. They took the Lone Star tick and developed a story out of that because what happened was they found a group of patients who had what's called delayed anaphylaxis, angioedema urticaria, after consumption of red meat and they found that these patients had Ig antibodies specific for galactose alpha-1,3 galactose. They had 24 patients and these patients would wake up in the middle of the night. They wouldn't get it after they ate the meal. They'd wake up in the middle of the night. They had negative prick tests to commercial uh, beef antigens. Uh, 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 and they had positive prick and ID to fresh meat and also to cetuximab. And they had a positive in vitro test. Now, we had the largest series of idiopathic anaphylaxis in the world. So uh, I had noticed in that uh, that we that many of our patients would wake up in the middle of the night, and I couldn't figure it out. Uh, we sent Sarah to uh, to Tom, and uh, a very high percent of our patients, this has been reported as well, uh, had anti alpha gal. Took the patients off red meat; uh, they did quite well, um, and and they had multiple episodes. Uh, that would be not only, of course, a beef, but also veal, uh, 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 any mammal, pork, etc. Um, it, it's interesting, um, around here many people salt their meat and uh, if they salt it, uh, many of them are able to eat it. I, I don't, it probably destroys alcohol, we haven't figured it out quite yet. But basically it's delayed hypersensitivity that occurs three to six hours after the consumption of mammalian meat. Uh, there's presence of IgE uh, uh, not only to alpha-gal but to also cats, dogs, and parasites. Uh, there's a characteristic geographical distribution and tick bites uh, under uh, the cases. Uh, this is correlating IgE to alpha Americanus, Americanus, that's the tick, Lone Star tick, on the left and on the bottom axis, uh, on the vertical axis is the tick, uh, on the bottom axis is IgE to alpha gal. Uh, and uh, recently it's quite interesting. Uh, this is a, a study that appeared in the uh, Blue Journal, uh, and they, you, you, this uh, is to fail the five uh, LD5 in cats uh, uh, is associated with uh, alpha gal. You can absorb LD5 with, uh, I, you can absorb IgE anti of LD5 with alpha gal. But it, it, and so that's why people don't get asthma. It's, it's against LD1, which is the which is the allergen in the air, but not LD5. And so. Uh, Alpha-gal antibodies uh, don't, even though they're on cat and exposed, don't produce uh, asthma in cat allergic uh, patients. Mm. So you have to eat the cat to have the reaction, right? You have to eat the cat. That's right. <laughs> and uh, actually, this has been reported uh, in certain countries in Asia where they eat cats and dogs. <laughs> okay. I wasn't going to go there, but okay. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, Jay, you're going to have to change your uh, your uh, eating habits. Okay. Uh, right. Now, so summary: Ig anti alpha gal should be considered as a cause of idiopathic anaphylactic events. We now order it routinely uh, in all our idiopathic anaphylaxis. It's available commercially, as you probably know, uh, through the people who bought IBT Laboratory. I'm blocking on their name, but you can look it up under IBT on Google. Uh, Ig anti alpha gal can be obtained commercially. It's prick test to fresh mammalian meat. We also now bring in the meat, and uh, we uh, test them to that. I don't have the courage that Tom Platts Mills did to do intradermals, uh, but he does intradermals. The next thing is mast cell activation syndrome. I've had a great deal of time wrapping my mind around this. Uh, it's a difficult concept. These are all of the uh, synonyms for what should now be called mast cell activating syndrome. Uh, and there, there are multiple ones. Uh, and that's why it's been so confusing. But recently, uh, it's been clarified. But before I get to that, 
Uh, this is sort of the seminal article, and Sim Aiken reported this, uh, and colleagues, Dean Metcalf as well, when Sim was at the NIH, uh, in, in a journal called Blood. And it received short, only not much in, uh, uh, public publicity in the allergy literature originally, but it was presented as an abstract. And what he showed was that 12 patients with idiopathic anaphylaxis, none with classical bone marrow findings for systemic mastocytosis, but who had some evidence, minor criteria on the bone mass, on, on the, on the uh, biopsy for mastocytosis, had a C-kit activating point mutation. Now, we, we just heard uh, uh, Tom, uh, we just heard uh, Dr. Fleischer uh, talk about point mutations. Uh, and uh, saying uh, that it occurs in uh, what one percent I forgot what he said but this is a point mutation it's a uh, it's an alanine to valine mutation in the CKIT receptor and we'll talk about it in a minute it's located uh, here this you see the CKIT receptor the CKIT receptor is not only a growth receptor it's an epi it's it's a um, tyrosine kinase uh, a, a growth receptor very similar to the epidermal growth receptor uh, that is uh, abnormal in um, GI cancers uh, and uh, uh, hairy cell leukemia. Uh, and uh, what it does is it causes the growth of mast cells and it also lowers the threshold for sensitization uh, for release because it is an auto-catalyzing receptor. It catal it's a tyrosine kinase receptor that catalyzes itself. And when that happens, uh, it releases its granules. So these people will walk around, and they will develop life-threatening anaphylaxis uh, for unknown provocation reasons uh, and previously have been classified as idiopathic. Now, with that background information, uh, a new nosology has developed. And, and I think it's very important. Uh, that we look at that. Uh, this is the uh, seminal paper. It was published in the International Archives, and it was a group of people that met uh, in uh, Vienna. And uh, due to the good graces of Dean Metcalf, I happened to attend, uh, be there as part of the part of the party. Uh, and uh, what they did uh, while I listened, basically, was to uh, try to clarify this mess. And the criteria for the diagnosis of mast cell activating syndrome that they established was anaphylactic symptoms, a transient increase in mast cell mediators, uh, and it had to be significant, and this was the definition of significant. A serum tryptase increase of 20% plus 2 nanograms with four, within four hours of a reaction. Now, how did we derive that? It's based upon a series of unpublished data that Larry Schwartz had collected. He was a member of the committee. Uh, and, and this is what uh, he found o over a period of about 10 years uh, to, to be significant. And then you have to respond to agents that will attenuate the production or activation or activities of these mediators. Okay? So that's the definition. Now, mast cell activating syndromes, then, can be either due to allergy. So this is a person, a kid, who eats a peanut. That's a mast cell activating system, uh, uh, syndrome. It can be due to what I just discussed with you, either mastocytosis or the Sim Aiken described form frust of mastocytosis with negative bone marrow findings but positive 816B mutations. And that's very important clinically, and I'll tell you why in a minute. So that could be primary mastocytosis, that's SMSY, systemic mastocytosis, or it could be monoclonal activating syndrome with an 816B mutation. And then those which have none of those things will remain as idiopathic uh, mast cell activating system, which is the ident identical concept to idiopathic mastocytosis. 
So you have IgE-mediated disease, you have systemic mastocytosis, or it's formed through uh, uh, de uh, derivative, and you have idiopathic mastocytosis. Now, uh, that's called idiopathic anaphylaxis in the old parlance. So, uh, how do we make the distinction, and is it important to make the distinction uh, between uh, idiopathic anaphylaxis and either masto or its derivative? This is the clonal versus idiopathic uh, anaphylaxis. 83 patients with mast cell activating symptoms they had anaphylaxis. Uh, 51 were clonal, 32 were non-clonal. 48 of the 51 clonal met the criteria for uh, mastocytosis on biopsy. The rest did not. Uh, and the features that were predictive of clonal were male sex, they more often had shock, and a higher frequency of cardiovascular problems and insect-related episodes even when they had negative skin tests, so that we know, and we've known for a long time, that mastocytosis or the 816V malformation in the absence of mastocytosis uh, predisposes to insecting anaphylaxis, and I'll show you why later, in the absence of IgE even. This, excuse me, this shows the differences uh, in idiopathic anaphylaxis uh, in the clear bars, non-clonal, uh, they had more skin symptoms and less cardiovascular, less shock. They had more respiratory. So uh, there's a score that these authors proposed, uh, and I just you can it's too complicated to go over. But I got the reference at the bottom of this. Uh, I don't go. I don't particularly like this score uh, because it's not 100% positive. And I've had patients using the score where I've made mistakes on. But I wanted to show it to you so you'd be aware of it. But I want to caution you that uh, that it's important that we make this distinction. And and I'll go over with you why it is important in in just a minute. There was one other article that came from Boston. That was a, a, a Spanish study. And this is what I call the soft symptoms of mast of mast cell activating disease. Uh, these were a group of patients who had a sort of wear symptoms. They they had abdominal pain. They had poor concentration and memory. They were a little bit uh, goofy type, and they had a lot of nasal ocular symptoms. Uh, and so, in summary, if you compared everything, if you look at mast cell activating, uh, they had more flushes, if you look at the clonal, uh, highs are less common. They had nasal symptoms, wheezing a little more about the same, but they had much more hypotension, headache, diarrhea, and abdominal symptoms, and some of them were a little bit weird. Now, why is that important? OK, let me illustrate that by a case. Uh, it was a very embarrassing case to me. The case was sent to me by another allergist and from out of town. And uh, the, 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 the gentleman, who was about 30-something years old, uh, had had really terrible, terrible episodes of anaphylaxis, life-threatening episodes, uh, and had been admitted to the hospital for a few days on a number of different occasions. And it had about 10 or 11, I can't remember, by the time I saw him. And uh, we worked him up, you know, like you would normally do, and we did three baseline serum triptase uh, as a screening test for cystitosis. All were five or less uh, on each occasion. Uh, after he had had several episodes, uh, one particularly uh, difficult episode, uh, he and his wife came to the office and, and told me, uh, they, had, they asked me to send them somewhere else. I was already their third allergist. Uh, and, and, and I said, well, let me send you to Mayo. Now, I had contemplated doing a biopsy on him, but I didn't because three serum tryptase, and he was reluctant. He went to Mayo's, and they just immediately went to the biopsy. There was nothing else left to do. He had mastocytosis, hmm. but he didn't have 816V. He had all the characteristic features of mastocytosis on biopsy but he had a negative 816V mutation. Now, you can screen for an 816V uh, on blood, 
but it has to usually be pretty bad. Uh, it's usually negative. So you almost, you really have to do a bone marrow. Uh, and the reason it's important is this. If they're negative 816V, some will respond to Gleevec. So we put this patient on Gleevec. He's now been on it for about two years. He's never had another episode. Wow. Uh, uh, it's the same thing, you, you know, that you would use for uh, uh, hair reset leukemia, monocytic leukemia, I believe, as well. Uh, it, it's a tyrosine kinase inhibitor. Now, it doesn't fit into the pocket of 816V mutation-induced uh, uh, abnormalities, but evidently it fits into the pocket of other uh, other codon uh, point mutations. And there are going to be more and more as we go along. Uh, so. Uh, the important point take home is uh, you got to do a biopsy. Now, what's the threshold of a biopsy? The threshold dose uh, commonly accepted now has been lowered from 20, uh, which is your normal lab of tryptase, uh, down to 11.7. And the reason for that is in, in retrospective review of uh, systemic anaphylaxis due to N16, um, a risk uh, a serum tryptase of 11.7 or, or, uh, was the break point. Uh, for a statistically increased uh, incidence of mastocytosis uh, in uh, patients with insecting anaphylaxis. The next topic we're going to cover is uh, the media. People don't die with anaphylaxis very often. The incidence uh, is uh, less than 1%, uh, probably 1% or less, I would say. Uh, and partially the reason is that you produce your own treatment. Uh, compensatory mechanisms are produced, and they include uh, norepinephrine from ganglion, epinephrine from the adrenal, angiotensin from the kidney, uh, and uh, endothelium, endothelium from the endothelium. And these then uh, are vasoconstrict, uh, and they uh, raise the blood pressure, so they uh, stop deaths. Uh, here is an example of these compensatory responses. We see blood pressure uh, here. We see norepinephrine levels here, angiotensin 2 here, epinephrine here angiotensin 1 here, angiotensin 1 is converted to angiotensin 2, uh, and, and therefore what we see is that people bring themselves out of shock. Uh, another thing that happens later on is you secrete IL-10, um, and uh, it's the, the, the more severe the episode, the more IL-10 you make, and as you know, uh, IL-10 is an antiphlogistic uh, 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 interleukin. And we also know uh, that the angiotensin uh, con, uh, the, uh, ang uh, renin angiotensin system is uh, uh, very important. If you look at patients with venom anaphylaxis and you look at point mutations in the angiotensin uh, gene polymorphisms, uh, M235T uh, is associated with increased frequency as well as severity uh, of anaphylactic events. And it's real interesting as well. I don't know if you've seen this, but uh, uh, Tecturna, uh, I, I can't remember, it's called, ah, dad, damn it, I can't remember its generic name, Ascrolyne or Aliscrin, I think it's Aliscrin, is an antitensive that interferes with uh, that uh, uh, angiotensin uh, uh, production. It's, it's not like an ACE inhibitor, an ACE blocker, but decreases the production. And recently, uh, a, a retrospective review has found that the instance of anaphylaxis uh, uh, far exceeds that of other antihypertensives, and begins. It's now beginning to rival that uh, with ACE inhibitors, and it interferes with angiotensin. So the take-home message of this is uh, that uh, uh, you you have to watch what you give uh, to these patients. Uh, if a patient is prone to anaphylaxis, these are the agents uh, which uh, I would recommend you be cautious uh, uh, with. Beta blockers you're, we're all familiar with. ACE inhibitors, uh, uh, ACE blockers, monoamine oxalase inhibitors, and tricyclics. Uh, the beta blockers you understand. The tricyclics, we'll go to the bottom first. What happens with tricyclics is that um, they don't make anaphylaxis worse, but they, 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 they make it difficult uh, to know what dose of epinephrine to give because uh, uh, epinephrine is metabolized, the catechols are metabolized in several different ways, but one of those ways uh, for norepinephrine uh, is to be reuptake at the, uh, uh, at the nerve endings, and they block that. So now there have been several cases of stroke 
uh, reported uh, with uh, in the dental office with more than 100,000 concentrations of epi as a vasoconstrictor on people uh, with uh, tricyclics. And if you look in the PDR under Ellaville, for example, uh, it clearly states that as a warning. Monoamine oxidase inhibitors for the same reason. They block the uh, destruction through monoamine oxidase. Uh, uh, and uh, that, therefore, complicates the dosing. Uh, now, if we go to ACE blockers and ACE inhibitors, and, and I would now add, which I hadn't added yet, uh, the angiotensin uh, pr pr uh, pr prohibitors, angiotensin synthesis prohibitors, such as Tecturna, onto that list. Uh, uh, if we look at uh, ACE inhibitors, they're worse than blockers. They're worse than blockers. And the reason for that is bradykinin is synthesized, as we showed you before, in um, anaphylaxis. So that ACE inhibitors have two points of action. They uh, inhibit uh, the your angiotensin uh, uh, activity plus they prevent the, the destruction of bradykinin. Uh, and so you get excess bradykinin, and you get the failure of angiotensin uh, to work, whereas angiotensin blockers only work on angiotensin. We're going to close out with a few slides that just give you a, some uh, isolated uh, clinical uh, uh, information that I think is important at, at the fellow stage. Uh, I don't care how mild an episode was when you see a patient. Uh, uh, the, the, even if it was, say, milder to carry with the loose GI symptoms or milder to carry with the patient, maybe complaining of shortness of breath, that, uh, that may be predictive of a severe reaction because it is unpredictable. This is Scott Sischer and Estelle Simon's series. Every time you see an asterisk, uh, it means that uh, there was a statistic that, that that the second or third episode was worse than the first. Uh, the other thing is that uh, a very significant number of patients uh, require more than one dose. So there are a series and the percent of patients that required more than one dose. Some of these were, uh, were uh, biphasic, some were just severe, and some, roughly 14,000 cases, stuck it in their thumb. Okay, so they lost the first dose. So um, it, it, now that all, it's only available as a two-pack, this doesn't become very terribly important because you can't get it as a single. But uh, with it, I used to show this to show you you really need the two-pack. And what we do in most every patient is we give three two-packs. But human nature being what it is, uh, we know that they're going to forget to carry it with them. Uh, so we keep them one at home, one in the car, and uh, one uh, on their person. And even though heat destroys it, uh, it can still be used. It has residual activity in almost all instances. And, and you other, always warn the patients not to split the two-pack into two individual doses, which some people very, are inclined to do. Very good point. Uh, I just had the case where a doctor's child, uh, <laughs> the, the pediatrician's child, the, the, the mama, did that, the, the, the pediatrician, and uh, the child took a dose, didn't have enough, had to go to the hospital. Uh, this is important as well. Uh, you know, antihistamines are just about worthless, and I'm going to show you why. The median time to respiratory or cardiac arrest was 30 minutes for foods. This is Pumphrey series uh, for venom, 15 minutes, and for intra-office, uh, five minutes for atrogenic reactions. This is um, Estelle's data. Uh, this is the time to CMAX after I am in the uh, thigh. And if you look at the pharmacokinetics, the pharmacodynamics, it mirrors this. In other words, uh, blood pressure and pulse go up in 10 minutes. If you compare that to diphenhydramine uh, given by uh, mouth or fexofenadine given by mouth and by diphenhydramine by injection, you see uh, suppression of skin test activity takes 50% suppression by injection takes 57 minutes. That's by uh, 50 milligrams of Benadryl uh, by injection. If you give it by mouth, it's 70 something minutes. So that the onset of action was, uh, uh, in, in essence, 
so late that uh, it would not have prevented a fatality. Now, the point of, of, of fact is, uh, as we well know, that people get well, so that it's a, uh, you know, we see it happen with our own eyes, and, we're, and patients use it, and they get better, and, and it reinforces this uh, in, incorrect uh, practice. So, um, in conclusion, anaphylaxis is increasing. Uh, we have new insights into idiopathic anaphylaxis, and I would refer you to the alpha-gal that you can order, uh, and I would refer you to the decreased uh, threshold for doing uh, trip to, uh, bone marrows. Uh, multiple mediators are involved, uh, and many aren't contained in mast cells. And the reason we don't die is endogenous compensatory responses, uh, but that does not allow us uh, to uh, get away without uh, treating with epinephrine. Thanks. I'm happy if, if we have time to answer your questions. Oh, that was great. Thank you so much, uh, Phil. That, that was uh, very, very informative. I always learn quite a bit when I listen to you, so we really appreciate it. I'm going to go ahead and make us the uh, presenter again, just so you, everybody can okay. see us. Here we go. See our screen. So we do have a few minutes. If anyone has any questions, you can unmute your microphone by clicking on the little green phone icon or type a message into the chat box if you want to ask a question of Dr. Lieberman. Any questions for Dr. Lieberman at this point? Anybody here? Well, one thing that I wanted to ask, uh, you mentioned that the tricyclics meant that uh, the patients had strokes and they would reduce the metabolism of epinephrine, but that, that sort of leads to a reluctance by many physicians to give epinephrine in the context of anaphylaxis, especially in elderly people, they're afraid of stroke or people who might be on certain medications. Are there any specific contraindications for epinephrine or should you give it anyway or what, what do you recommend? Yeah, it's a great question, Jay. And I, yeah, there is no specific contraindication. Uh, I think that that's a, a very important point uh, that in the face of a true anaphylactic event, uh, it, the the benefit outweighs the risk. And I think that you know there are very few things that uh, you can say universally, but I, I would say that that's as close as we come to being a universal mandate. Well, you, you mentioned a few point mutations that were associated with this increased mast cell activation syndrome. We have patients who, uh, when we're giving allergy shots, uh, seem to have a real hard time building up because they keep having reactions to the immunotherapy, we've always thought maybe they're just overly sensitive to it, but the skin tests aren't necessarily really large. Is there any place for doing those kinds of assays in patients who seem to have an increased risk of anaphylaxis? It's a great question. I never thought of it, and I don't know. <laughs> uh, I, you know, it's never been reported uh, to any other uh, well, it's, it's to any other anaphylactic syndrome, to my knowledge, but insect sting. Uh, and, and I'm not sure uh, why that's true. I, I wish I did know, but, uh, but I, I've never thought about it in the context of allergy injections, uh, so I can't answer. Well, we all have a large group of people like that, so maybe next year you can tell us what, what you found after you do this. <laughs> <laughs> as soon as I get my first R01, I can do that. I, I think so. Um, any other comments or questions from the group? Brock, Brock you're very quiet. Did you want to add anything? Uh, the question icon wasn't on there, at any rate, uh, on the screen. Anyway, yeah, I, I always have a couple little questions, but I, I was really glad to see the comments on multiple inflammatory pathway activation uh, that we, we really have never appreciated in asthma and everything else. And uh, one. One note that people should be aware of is that coagulation pathway is activated during asthma and that uh, those people uh, have much shorter clotting times, which is, I, I've always found that uh, uh, substantiates that uh, multiple inflammatory pathway stuff. But uh, I just found it a great lecture, You're really interesting and, and uh, um, you know, I've got several questions but they're probably inane. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Any other comments or questions from the group? Everybody's yeah, unmuted now. Muted so. now so. Uh, well, I guess I better unmute everybody. Well, oh, by the way, uh, FLD5 is CAT IgA. That's yes, okay. you're right. That's, that's I forgot to mention that you're exactly yeah, it's right. It's glycosylated, so it's got the alpha-gal thing on it. Yeah. Yes, that's right. right. Thanks, thanks, Brock. 
All right. Well, we're going to stop there. Um, Thank you. Jim, we really appreciate it, Dr. Lieberman, for joining us today, uh, Dr. My Phil pleasure. Lieberman. Uh, this is Conferences Online Allergy from Children's Mercy Hospitals and Clinics. Uh, join us again on Friday for our next uh, series of conferences on sublingual immunotherapy and billing and coding. In the meantime, have a great week, everyone, and we'll see you next time. Thank you. Yeah. Great, Jay. This has been an ACAAI production. To learn more about conferences online allergy or the American College of Allergy, Asthma, and Immunology, go to acaai.org. See you next time.